Well, good morning, ladies. Hope that wasn't so loud. I scared you. Some of you jumped while ago. <laughs> well, welcome to Van Buren First Assembly, First Ladies 2019 Women's Conference. We're going to be women of confidence, right? Yeah. We're excited about today. We want you to have fun. We want you pumped up about today. We are going to do stuff from the front of this sanctuary here all the way to the very back. So you just get ready. We're going to have a good time, okay? I want to say some big thank yous to a lot of people because something like this doesn't go off with just me by myself. So thank you very much to our beautiful ushers and greeters that we have had this morning. Give them a big hand with their beautiful smiles this morning. We thank you for that. Our uh, sound and camera crew and technology team, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I know nothing about that stuff, so I thank you so much for doing that. Also, to let you know that uh, today is being recorded, and it will be on our VBFA um, YouTube channel today, so that I'll download that, or I'll put it on the fir First Lady's uh, Facebook page. You can share away and enjoy that. And tell those, there were a lot of people that couldn't make it today, ball games and mom stuff that happens. So um, if they missed out today, tell them to go on there and listen to that, and they'll enjoy that. I uh, also want to say a big thank you to Marsha and Lauren for the help with our little setup here. They robbed Debbie's office, and we thank them for that because it looks so cute up there, nice and feminine today. Miss Joni and the VBA worship team and band, thank you, thank you, thank you. During all their practices, I'm telling you, we had church just singing uh, during those practices, so it was a lot of fun. These girls are talented, and, and I appreciate them. They're my friends, and I love y'all. So... Um, Thank you to Miss Sandy Lawrence. I don't know that she's in here. I think she's cooking right now, but she is doing lunch today. We're having lasagna and salad and garlic bread and desserts. My goodness, we've got Italian cream cake, chocolate cake, carrot cake. Now you're excited. <laughs> now y'all are awake, girls, so it's going to be a good time. Uh, we're going to pray hard, we're going to eat good, and we're going to laugh hard, too, when it's all said and done. So it's going to be a good day today. Right now, I want you to get out your tickets. And I need you to get out a pen when you do that. You may have to share with your neighbor. But I want you to get out your ticket, and I want you to write your name on there real good where I can read it, your first and your last name. Because when I call Betty, if four Betty show up, then we have to identify handwriting, and don't stress me out. So write your name on your ticket, and I'm going to tell you what you're going to do with that. That is not only for your lunch today, but that is your chance to win some prizes. And we have some pretty cool prizes today, so I'm going to tell you some about those. As you go, I, we will stay in here, and after our service and after our altar time, I will dismiss everyone, and we will go over at the same time to the dining room where you will get, you'll drop your ticket off with Miss Susie there. She has a basket for that, and then you will get your plate, and we'll go down to the gym area. So your chances to win today are for a TJ Maxx card. Anybody like TJ Maxx? I think it's $50, too. Ooh, that's even better. Mama needs a new pair of shoes or something for the house, right? Brick City, we got a couple of gift cards for that. Tropical Smoothie. We've got some Ermich bracelets to give away. Uh, we've got Kendra Scott, a necklace and earring set that is beautiful. It's really hard to let go of that today, I'll just tell you. It's really pretty. And then a new Michael Kors purse. So you have a chance to win some big stuff today. So, so make sure you get that ticket out and you write your name on there real good. So I, I know exactly who it is that wins that. So um, some, some ladies are going to really get blessed today. So... I'm excited about it. I also want to give a big hand to Miss Alicia and her team because she is going to, uh, we're going to have some comedy time today and she's put that together. So get ready to laugh. I hope you brought your depends. You might need them today because it's going to be funny. Close your ears, Brother Gary. <laughs> you might need them because it's going to be a good time. So I um, also want to say thank you to Pastor Alice Nolan. She's such a beautiful lady on the inside and out. I have already enjoyed visiting with her. We've been kind of talking back and forth since January when I approached her with coming. So I thank you for coming today. I just want to let you know a little bit about her. She's an associate pastor at the Full Council Church in North Little Rock. 
Uh, she's a motivational speaker. She does conferences, prophetic teaching, and we are glad that you are here. So welcome to Van Buren. Yeah. Glad to have you there. I want to tell you a little bit. You're going to notice a lot of tulips in the decorations today. And if you know me, I'm, I'm number one, I'm a planner. I got to have things planned out. It bugs me if, it, if I don't have a plan. I got plan A and B, so I'm prepared to plan, okay? Well, I also like themes, okay? So when I get to plan in these conferences, I like to have a theme of what's going on. It just helps my mind, okay? So as we were talking, Miss Alice and I were talking, she liked the idea I was a theme person too. So I was like, all right, we're already sisters right now. I feel that. <laughs> so I began to, we began to talk to one another, and we kind of come up with the word confidence that kind of stuck out to us. And um, as I was working one day and praying, Lord, this conference is coming up, and I've got to have some plans you know, I've got to get, I've got to get a theme going on. I wasn't feeling anything for the theme. And I'm like, I have to have a theme. And so as I was working that day, I began to think of springtime. I love springtime. Tulips are one of my favorite flowers. So I thought, oh, we'll go with tulips. So I started looking at backgrounds. I sent those to Colby to help us with our graphic stuff and flyers and so forth. And so it, it just dawned on me one day as I was working, well, just look up the meaning of what tulips mean so I did and guess what they mean confidence so I was like Lord everything is ordered by you and I thank you for it he showed up I got a surprise bouquet of flowers on my desk one day at work and guess what was in them tulips so they keep showing up everywhere isn't God good when you want to hear from him and you want to see him you will if you open your eyes and your ears you will so it's exciting. Well, Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he is faithful to carry it out. And I'm thankful that he's faithful. <laughs> I, you know, I've prayed over every name that has been on this list as we were getting things ready for the conference and the names were appearing on here. Who was buying tickets? I started calling all those names out in prayer. Because it's not just about having a fun time today. Yeah, it, we're going to have a lot of fun and a lot of laughs. But you know what? It's about your heart today. And God speaking to you today more than anything. And so I began to pray over every one of those names as they were coming in. And this has been my prayer. That you will find freedom. That you will find freedom in Him. And the freedom that He gives you. And that you will, you will take hold of the fact that you are chosen. That you are His. And that uh, you are chosen and the fact that you are who he says you are. I'm so glad I don't have to depend on my neighbor next to me, your friend next to you, your relative next to you, or whatever it is to tell you who you are. You are his and you're chosen. And that he restores joy and he gives peace. And that you may feel his love in this place today. So I want you to stand up. Raise your hands up. We're getting ready to have church, girls. This should be the most exciting time. Lord, we invite you into this place, Lord. We want you to come in here and sweep over this place, Lord. Fill us right now, I pray. God, we give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, Lord. Holy and acceptable unto you, Lord, that you would use us, Lord. That you would open our ears, Lord, our eyes, Lord, to see you, to feel you today, Lord. God, anoint every part of this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Hallelujah.
feel it in my bones, you're about to move. I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So come.
we thank you, Lord, that we feel your presence in this place. But Lord, just move on us, I pray. Saturate us, Lord. Consume us with your fire. Transform us, Lord, like the song said. Transform us. Lord, there may be a mom out there today that's hurting, Lord. God, I pray right now, Lord, that you would restore her today, Lord. Someone's body may be in pain today, Lord. a big hand if she comes. Uh, as we were visiting at dinner last night, uh, she was cracking me up. I love this lady. She is funny. <laughs> we kind of dressed alike too. <laughs> uh, but she was talking to us about the time that she got saved. She was 34 years old when she got saved. And uh, she said people were telling her she had lost her mind. And she began to talk about how when she got baptized and how she went down to come up new. And I said, well, you did lose your mind, Miss Alice. <laughs> you got a new mind in Christ. Yes. So welcome to Van Buren. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the love that I certainly feel here in the company of awesome people of God. Renee and I just talked for a little bit before I felt comfortable enough to say girl, and she was saying girl. You know, you gotta feel comfortable with uh, <laughs> another woman to say girl, and so it wasn't long. But I sensed that her heart was so full with Wanting to be a blessing, I'm sure, all the time, but for the women's conference. And I just want to say to her, thank you for extending the love of God to me. Because when you're in ministry, you have to intentionally, I love that word, you have to intentionally make sure that you're guarding your heart at all times because... There's always going to be opportunity to be hurt, offended, get bitter. And so when you find someone who's been in ministry for a little while and they still have a sweetness and love about them, you know that they are there on purpose. You know they had the same warfare that some of us may have had that caused us to draw back and uh, not be friendly. But anyway, thank you, Renee, so much. And then there is Miss Joni. And I've known Miss Joni for a few years, a little while and now. When she and Pastor Brett were in Houston, they invited me to come and minister at their church. And Joni's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. She's the same. And that's a rare commodity. That from year to year, from decade to decade, you find that a person remains the same. And so I love her, and I'm not even mad because she's so petite. I could be. <laughs> I'm not a... I'm not ashamed to walk next to her. I could be. <laughs> but she's, she's really, really such a beautiful mother, wife, most of all, Christian. 
She's sincere about her walk. She's sincere about it, and she's serious. So thank you, Joni, for being you. And then, and then I want to thank you all. I just think you deserve a hand praise for yourself. You showed up. You showed up with expectation. You showed up wanting God to meet you at your point of need. And it took effort. It took effort. Every woman knows it takes effort to go anywhere. <laughs> we have to do something in order to go. So I want you to just give yourself a praise and say, thank me. I thank me. Amen. And then I'm going to be one more group of people, and that is one of my favorite first ladies, really, in the world, is Miss or Minister Angela Lawrence from Full Council of Fort Smith, she and her ladies. I don't think I've ever verbalized that to her. But she is one of my favorite because she's so serious about her assignment. She and Dr. Lauren, they pastor our satellite church in Fort Smith. And she told me that she and some of the ladies from uh, the church were coming. And I tried to act like, oh, don't y'all, oh, just don't do it. I know, I know, I know. I had to repent when I got around the corner, but <laughs> I feel like she knows me well enough to know I was just saying something. So she probably just said, oh, God, Alice, go on. <laughs> so thank you all for making the effort and being determined to come this morning. I love you all. Wow. And then, ladies, right before Renee called my name, I was just processing this. God wants you to know how much he loves you. How much he loves you. How much he loves you. We live in a world that there's so many people that pull on attention for themselves, to themselves, about themselves, that there is a void. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to say it. But sometimes we feel a void from hearing the expression of, I love you, I care about you, I see you, you're important. And God wants you to know this morning he sees you, he loves you, you're important, you matter, you matter. And I, I, and I know the pressure even of being a woman, sometimes we have to put on the face that we feel is acceptable when sometimes inside our hearts may be aching with pain, whether it is through pain of rejection, pain of hurt, pain because of brokenness, pain of betrayal, so we are here all different walks of lives, but we have a commonality that we are all women and the thing that God put in you as a woman, he did it on purpose and a part of your makeup as a woman is the desire to be loved and accepted. So embrace yourself this morning, knowing that God has already made the announcement that he loves you. And sometimes even when we hear that, our ministers say it or someone else or a friend, God loves you though, and we know that analytically, but there is that part of revelation that God wants to touch the heart. Because when we really, really, really know that God loves, loves us, there's something that changes in the makeup of who we are. 
I'm just going to share just a little bit before I get into our message for this morning. If I went by my life as a child, how I grew up, where I grew up, what I felt growing up, there is no way that I would be standing before you, a mic in my hand, and feel like I had anything to make as a deposit into your life. But it is because of the transformation that took place in me when I became born again, old things passed away and all things have become new. Wow. I did lose my mind when I first got saved. I did it on purpose. I found out in the word of God that he didn't want me to think the way that I had thought all of those years before salvation. I found that out. And so I had to make a choice. Am I going to put forth the effort to work on renovating Alice Nolan? The ultimate job was done, of course, by God. But I had a part to play in this. And so as that took place, I just became uh, weirder and weirder to a lot of people that knew me. And so on my job, they said, don't go back to OB, Alice, because that's where I worked. That was, and it was closed doors, of course. So you could hear everyone that came in and out when they entered into that section. And it was uh, isolated from the rest of the hospital. And I used to have company all the time. You know, people get on the, go on their breaks, and they would come by to want to talk to me. And we would play and kid around. Then my new story was... I got saved. Everybody, oh my God, did they get tired of here? How you doing, Alice? I got saved. How you doing, Alice? I got saved. I got saved. That was me every day. Mm. I got saved. So, working labor and delivery, I got an opportunity to meet a lot of mothers, great uh, grandmothers, and great grandmothers. So, Malvern being a small Township was one major place to eat, and that was Western Sizzling. If you went there, you were going to at least see 10 people that knew you by way of being there when their granddaughter, their grandson was born. And so they would always say, oh, Alice, we love you. How are you? I said, I got saved. I got saved. I would, some looks would be so strange and funny. They, would say, they wouldn't know how to respond, and respond, they would say, Oh, okay. That's good. After they said, that's good. But it didn't matter. That's how, I, how passionate I was about my new life. And so, we're going to open our hearts to receive a word this morning that I have full confidence there are some of you who are going to be revolutionized by what and how you see yourself. You're saved, you love God, but God wants you to love you. God says it's your turn to love you. So as we Get ready to get into the word of God. We have something at uh, my church, Full Council, Church of North Little Rock, Arkansas, where Bishop Silas Johnson and Dr. Jennifer Johnson are my pastors. And every Sunday morning, this is what our pastor has us say, repeat after him, and I'm just going to say it to you because it has resonated in my heart, in my spirit, and it has become my manual for life. 
This is my Bible. It is God's holy word. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I already have what it says I have. I will allow the word to transform my mind. My spirit has been renewed and I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. I will never, I will never be the same. That ending, I kind of just put my little twist on that. It still fell in line with the word of God. This morning, I want you to be attentive to a story that you're going to have passed before your eyes as you hear the word of God. And it's your story. It's your story because according to God, you and I are the producers of our lives. There was a thing that I didn't know. I knew it was kind of late, but this morning, all of these, oh, just like God was talking very fast and saying things to me, but he began to say, you, what are you pleased with what you've produced? And I said, produce it? Yeah, you know, you know you're the producer of your life. Tell the ladies, they're the producers of their lives. And so I'm a word person and I love words. But so I looked up the word produce, a person that makes or causes something. Now we know from in the movie industry, a producer is one that produces a movie. But I want us to pay attention to producer in regard to who God is. God is the creator of the script, and we become the producers. Now remember, this is your story. This is your story. I still getting acquainted with Facebook and all the different languages of the Facebook world. So when I would see someone say, this is, uh, I'll say Angela, this is Angela's story. So I would, on Instagram, I think it is, I would hit it. I think, oh my goodness, she's fixing to tell a story. <laughs> and when I hit it and I got there, I was being one little statement or not even anything, just a picture. And I said, you know what, I really don't get this. When it says story, I'm looking for a story. Just recently, I got it. It's different little segments that make up your story. When I say just recently, I got it as of this morning. <laughs> I got it this morning. Genesis 1, 26, we're all familiar with this verse of scripture. I wanted to read it from the message Bible, but I forgot to charge my phone, so I have no juice. And why would Genesis 1 be torn out of my Bible? Where is it? Where is the page? It's gone. But we know that Genesis 1, 26 is that God created male and female in his likeness and in his image. God is the creator. And we know that the Bible goes on to say that, and after God created man, he formed man a body. 
Now, it's significant this morning because I know that you know, so I'm not uh, trying to be any way, in any way condescending. But after God created man, and after he created you and I, the Bible says that he then formed man a body. We know the word of God out of the mist and the uh, the soil became a form, I will say clay, and he formed man a body and breathed into man the, his breath. The breath of God was breathed into him. So the two vital things are God, first of all, created you and I, and then he made us a body. We understand that the body is what we house or tabernacle the presence of God in. But in order for that to take place when we are born, we have got to come to a place of repentance and be reconciled back to God. And as Renee shared, I was 34 years old before I became a Christian. So I lived my childhood and we would go to school, Sunday school every Easter for sure. And uh, maybe a couple of other Sundays throughout the year, uh, riding the bus or our neighborhood church. Just my mother's going to dress us up and send us to church very few times throughout a year. And that's all I knew about church. But I had the concept of what church was supposed to be about. And so then I lived my life looking at my family structure and feeling like this is what life is supposed to be about. This is what family is supposed to be about. Not that I thought it was right, family, but I thought this is about what it's supposed to be about because everyone else that we knew, that's kind of the way their family was too. So, you know, of course, we kept company with people of like lifestyles. And it was all dysfunctional all dysfunctional. My father was illiterate. I realized he was ashamed of himself all of his life because he could not read or write. I mean, really, could not write his name. You know, you think, Someone signing a check with an X or their signature on paper with an X, that's just like way, way back there. But when I was growing up, that was my father. I did not know how embarrassed he was of his identity. And he and my mom were confrontational so much of the time. But not just verbally, there were times when there would be physical altercations. And so as children, we were afraid a lot of times. And it's the weekend and my father gambled. And so sometimes he would come home and wouldn't have but a small portion of what his paycheck was. So how many of you know that that kind of environment was not conducive for building a child's self-esteem about who they were. And so when I became a teenager and my concept or my thoughts of what I wanted when I got a husband, I need you to know this morning that all I had going for me was that I wanted him to be better than what my father was. That was, but how limited was that? I just wanted it to look like in him, whoever the man was going to be, that he was better, that he was going to not gamble all of his money. He was going to want to take care of his family. But I did not evaluate the fact that I had such a poor concept of who I was. So I realized after salvation that I was desperate without knowing I was desperate. I did not know it until I got 
saved, got in the word, and I realized, I went back in the pages of my story, and I realized that I was desperate. What do you mean? I realized that the thought in my subconscious was, I just want somebody to want me, and whoever it is, I will say yes to them. I'll say yes to them. My mother and father separated on and off all the time. And in 1967, my mother, sister told her, why don't you come to Arkansas? And she and my father separated, which ended up being the last, the last time of separating. And my mother packs her children up, moves to Arkansas, to live with an aunt and uncle who they never had children and my mother has five children and herself and we move with this aunt and uncle. And I remember looking at my mother, I'm 17 years old and crying because I knew my mother lived a life of pain. She had med medical issues, but I knew she had a broken heart even before we left Texas. And while we're in Texas, I'm telling just my story to connect you to seeing your story and coming up with the conclusion. Is your story being produced according to your desire? All of us, we're here and we're different ages. Young, middle-aged, more mature, and more, more mature. <laughs> but just because we've matured doesn't mean that we like our story. So we're all here with the same need God wants to make it your desire this morning, not just a need, but your desire. So at 16, before we moved to Arkansas, I remember going in the kitchen, you all, this is so vivid. Remember, this is my story. And I stood there and I started crying and I said, Mama, maybe if we go to church, things will be better. I said that to her because I was hurting, that my mom was hurting. My mother was hurting. She didn't tell me she was. I saw her. I knew the time she'd go and hide in the bedroom, and I just hurt for her. Anyway, we moved to Arkansas, and I met this young man. I was a senior in high school, my senior year. Check that out. My senior year, and I'm going to a new school now. I make all new friends, like for real. My senior year, oh my God. So I went, came to Arkansas, not even thinking about friends. I just want to make it through and graduate. That's all, because friends, the people I considered and thought were my friends, they are in, in Dallas, and here I am in Arkansas. So who embraced me first but this young man? Gets on the school bus, says some little corny thing that I just, got googie-eyed over. It was so silly. <laughs> but he paid attention to who? To me. And we end up calling ourselves an item. We got married a couple of years, a year and a half later, we graduated from high school and less than a, the follow, another year, about six, eight months, we married. and. Um, I won't give a lot of details to, into a marriage. It lasted for 22 years, but it was very dysfunctional. I found myself more impaired after marrying and not feeling validated than I was before I got married. 
I didn't know this until God showed me how impaired I was as a woman. So a lot of my passion in ministering to women is a part of me knowing so many stories that were not told to me. So God wants to rebuild in some of our lives, restore. He wants to renovate in most of our lives. That means getting rid of things that just don't work for you and your purpose. And maybe some of us have been trying to hang on to them. So this morning, early as the Spirit of God began to speak to me about, you know, you're a producer. And I thought, oh, a producer. Yes, you're, you're the producer of your life. He said, you know, in the film industry, a producer is one who, produ who is the producer of a movie. But that's the one who has the script who writes the script a lot of times. But the director in a movie is the originator of the script. So I want you to get a picture of you and God. God is the director of your story. You've been given the script and God the director is in his director chair seeing if you are following the script. Why? Because it's the director who wrote the script and knows the vision of the script and knows if you're walking our, the script out according to how he wrote it. You and I have been given a script. And God has left the producing of that script up to us. But the thing that's sad about it is how many of us live life not having that revelation, that understanding. That God is the director. He's the script writer. We hear it all the time. If we've just been saved a short period of time, we hear that. God is the creator of all of us. He created us. We know that analytically. But in your heart, if you know that God created you, then you and I know that God does not create without purpose. God does not create without purpose. Excuse me, you all. So how wrong it is of me to act like, yeah, God created me, but I'm really not satisfied with what he did when he came to me. I really got some issues about what he did for me. And you see, I understand we have to look straight face. We have to can't look around. And we can't look at our neighbor or friend like, ooh, she's talking to me. So we just act like, wow, that's really, hmm, that's good. You know, we, we know how to do it. We, we do. Our inner pain has taught us how to look like, my pain is not hurting me. You have to figure it out. Try and figure it out if I have any, because I'm going to look like I don't. But this is our conference this morning in regard to confidence. How can I be confident about the me that a lot of the times I don't even like? And you're saying you want me to be confident? I didn't get dealt a fair hand. So how am I going to win in the game of life? Because that's the thinking of so many. I'm not talking about just the world believers. Some of us seated here this morning. Oh, if we did a survey this morning, 
and we got a piece of paper. And Renee said, I want you to write down three things that you just despise about yourself. The majority of us would say, well, you know, I don't really like despise this, but, you know, I might not like my nose or I may wish I had a different color. I, oh, we minimize the truth of what we spend our lives with sometimes messed up about when it comes to us. So God is the creator, right, of the script. We became the producers. And I'm going to uh, produce according to the reality of my creativity. I'm going to. Now, that's the will of God for us to produce according to the reality of the creator's purpose in me. So when God, when a minister, your pastor, a pastor, a minister says, every one of us were born with purpose. 80% of the body of Christ at that any given time is not sure that they really believe that, much less understand that. We act like we do, but do you this morning know and understand and you're able to say, I know my purpose. I know why God created me. We struggle with that because we try to make it unattainable in comprehension. Well, I don't know my purpose. I want to know my purpose. And if I, the, uh, Miles Monroe said years ago, way before his uh, death, if you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will inevitably, ever, ever, ever to believe abuse it. All I needed to do was take a look at my life and say, well, that's the truth. Have you done anything that was abusive to you? You didn't really want to hurt you, but because you didn't understand the awesomeness of who you are, according to the creator, you did not take care of you the way that the creator ordained for you to take care of you. Said, oh, we want to give us an example of that? Yes. The scripture created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. That's the director's script for my life. And if I recognize I don't have a clean heart and I'm not quoting that scripture and confessing and making a declaration that God, thank you for creating in me a clean heart and renewing, that has everything to do with what my story is going to be like. What's your story this morning? God is the director of the script. Guiding in the fulfillment of the vision. When you think about what your completion in life is going to be, what do you look like? What do you look like? If the word of God, and it is, is the script of all of our lives, how much attention do you and I pay to the script? Have you seen interviews with movie stars and they give testimony of getting the script for a role in the mail? And they study the script so that as they're studying the script to memorize it, they're taking on the character that they're going to be portraying in the script. Anybody connect that? Sorry, I'm uh, guzzling the water. And my mouth got dry when I stepped up here. But they're studying the script. And they're getting it in their spirit. What this character 
is going to be like because they know they're gifted enough to transform into that character. Now they all, they know that it's for you know or not the key is for play, that they're really not the character, but they want to identify with the character so their role will be so convincing that when you, while you're looking at them, you see them as the person they're portraying. But the thing with God is that that's similar to us, but we're not pretending when we read our script. We are doing exactly what our script says we're to do and acting that way because it's our story. And God wants your story, my story, to end well. But see, that's, even in that, that's not enough when it came to God's thoughts. I don't want it just to end well, Alice. I want your life to be well. I don't want it just to end. I want it to be well. In 1960, we were living in Detroit, Michigan. And my, I was 14 years old. And my uncle took us to a movie. And the name of the movie was imitation of life. Now I'm 14 years old and it's had a, uh, it's been re, a remake of it several times since 1959. That was 1959 was the year the movie came out, was released, that I went to the theater. First of all, it was a big treat for my uncle to take us. It was four of us, his nieces and nephew. We went to the movie. He took us to the movie, and that was just a major because uh, I think at that time, if I'm not mistaken, I'd have never even been to a, a movie theater. But we're there, and we're watching the movie, and the movie just had us crying at the end of it. We didn't know it was going to end that sad. But that movie impacted me at 14 years old. I'm looking at the movie, and I'm talking to this little biracial girl about being so mean to her mind. All through the movie, my mind is just... Oh, you should love your mother. Why are you treating her like that? I was just messed up from the get-go. I just wanted her to be right, and she just wasn't getting right, and I just thought, why won't you get right? And so then I, I, I just remember the impact, and I, I thought about it, and I thought, why did that movie have such an impact? Because I could not relate to it. I was not biracial. My mother did die early, and I'll share that with you. My mom, was back. she was 40 years old. I was 18 and my youngest sister was five years old and my mother died. But during the time I'm watching a movie, my mother had not died. So I'm looking at the movie and in the sto her story, she, her mom dies. And here this scene is with this coffin in this beautiful carriage with these horses. And the girl, they couldn't find the daughter because she had just been in rebellion and she heard that her mother died and she comes running in to mess Alice Stolen up. Uh, <laughs> crying and screaming and oh my God, it's not like I hadn't cried enough. She's just boo-hoo and now I'm feeling sorry for her. Now I was mad at her at first, now I'm feeling sorry for her. I told her to go home and she wouldn't. She wouldn't go home, you all. I kept telling her, go home. She wouldn't go home. So now, it's too late, her mama's dead. <sighs> I took a deep breath. I wanted to tell my uncle, don't ever take me to another movie like this. I'm so sad now, I don't know what to do. And I'm 14 years old, so there was only a certain limit. I, my mental ability of maturity would take me to in processing that movie. But I did have enough maturity to end it with, life is all about choices. Life is all about choices. Life is all, I, I'm saying that and I want it to resonate because someone struggling in life this morning, your life, based on choices that you make, you do good for a minute. 
And then you find yourself going back to that old place called familiar. Life is about choices. So in imitation of life, God wants us to know this morning, what is your story? Before salvation, there are scripts not written by God for your life. That fake producer and director try to influence the making of your story. They try. We know the enemy has everything to do with the rewriting of your true script for life. Are you producing your true story? Life is a byproduct of the choices that we make. Are you trying to do life according to nothing that has to do with your purpose? Are you trying to live life outside of what the director wrote for your life purpose? Uh, this, believe it or not, is a foundation that I'm establishing so that when we get to the part this morning of you taking charge and responsibility and accountability for your mind, you will be convinced that it is the thing that you owe yourself. God has already given you and I everything that pertains to godliness. But you and I have to make a decision. I got saved, and I knew that wasn't enough. I knew it wasn't. I was so happy when that, the day that I got saved, the night. I stood there at this altar and said, my life will never be the same. The Spirit of God revelated that to me. Standing at the altar, I just had a no soul. My life wasn't going to be the same. But then I started connecting dots. If my life is not going to be the same, that means I can't remain the same. I knew the way that I thought it had to be contrary to the way God thought and what God thought about me. Now, we had a Bible in our house, but it was just there. Because, like, that's the thing you do. You have a Bible in your house. But it's not that we read it. It's not that I knew anything about the Bible. It's not that I had a desire to pick it up. So I am clueless on how to live a Christian life. But my passion and want to was major. It was major. So I found out that God will cause people to cross your path that will help you on the journey to tell your story. God will send people to cross your path. And so that's what, that's what happened to me. With every wrong, bad choice we've ever made, God's redemptive plan has the power to rewrite the script. God, in the body of Christ, we have got to come to a place of strength where we say, I refuse to be a pauper any longer as a Christian. I refuse to feel deprived, rejected, unwanted, and devalued any longer. I refuse to, I refuse to, I re we have a generation coming up that we owe it to. 
We owe it to the next generation. I, I want to tell you this. Do you know that the way you and I think, as a man thinketh, so is he, and the way that we think, we influence the next four generations with our thinking for now. That's why we sometimes sit and talk and you say, oh, my grandmother said that. I'm a grand great grandmother. I'm just like so-and-so. I'm just like, or you might not even say it, but you look and you evaluate and say, ooh, I act just like cousin so-and-so. Or ooh, I act like, because my Thinking affects my actions, and my action and my thinking together influence people that are connected to me by way of DNA. Oh, yes, somebody. <laughs> the thing that disconnects the DNA of something that we don't want for our lives and in our lives is the blood of Jesus, the testimony of his witness for our lives. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them. And you shall have the petition that you, had, you made as a request to God. I needed to have my DNA mentally changed. My mind was corrupt from generations of corruption repeating their story to me. Do we hear that? Repeat it. So sometimes when we don't understand the power of transformation, we do things that are detrimental to our success and our happiness. And then we condemn ourselves and we repeat the cycles over and over and over. <laughs> so I, I had become a byproduct of how I think. If I, and if you can become a byproduct of how you think, then you can also become a byproduct of your new mind. Now that sounded pretty good. That sounded neat, didn't it? But think about it. If I really believe that, I'm seated here today, and I really believe that. That means I already know. Something's already taken place. I already had my old thinking interrupted, and I'm about to start a new journey in life. My story, I already know that because the revelation of what I just said became an epiphany as I heard it go in. So what about all the times I heard it before and I did nothing? I just remained the me I was. Have you ever tried to counsel someone, tell them the things they should do to help empower their future and their present state of being, and they left your presence and you knew they were going to remain who they were thinking the same way? It was frustrating, wasn't it? But I also have to bring it back to me. The times that I know a truth and operate in something that is not truth according to who I am and my creator. Would you turn to Romans chapter 12? What are you going to do now that you've given the opportunity to rewrite your story? To rewrite or relive your story. It's already been written, and we've got to connect with the author or the scriptwriter, the director. Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is the first scripture that I memorized. Everyone has something that spoke to them initially as a Christian. That it just spoke to you. And we all have scriptures that speak to us. This was the one that spoke to me from the beginning of my new walk. And I like to read it from the Amplified Translation. 
I appeal to you, brethren, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all of your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. What? Reasonable? Rational? Intelligent? Reasonable? Rational? That sounds like the Apostle Paul is trying to say, this is how you act when you got good sins. This is what you do when you got good sins. And they just kind of, ah, okay. Then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, this age fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial custom. You mean, I've been putting all that effort into doing Things like the world did them, and you're saying they're superficial? Yeah. Adapted to its external superficial custom. But be transformed, meaning change, by the entire renewal of your mind. Oh, I can't go any further without backing up first, right? Be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind. It sounds like the Apostle Paul was saying, God want me to empty my mind out. Everything pertaining to my way of thinking, he wants me to empty it out and start over again. Sounds like that to me. See, I had to repeat that to myself because I really didn't believe it at first, that God just didn't want me to leave anything there. But it was only momentarily. God did not say that he would not put things in perspective once I got a hold of my thinking and started thinking the way that I should think and there would be things that could be added back. But we look at it arrogantly and we don't look at the entire position of my mind, emptying everything out, the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideas, its new attitude. Oh, I, I need us to stop a second. Its new attitude, your mind and my mind has an attitude. Is the attitude of your mind falling in line with the script that's written for your life. The attitude of my mind. Sometimes we think we have an attitude and not include our mind in it. But the reality is my mind has the attitude first before my body reacts with an attitude. I thought attitude before I had an attitude. <laughs> the, the thought came to mind. And she walked in here like she thought she was something. Um, <laughs> for real? So that thought came first, and then I started doing my body language. Right? <laughs> well, what did she? I mean, I, when the thought... <laughs> is allowed freedom, its manifested place and position is in our body. Because it's through my soul that I release what I thought. It's in my soul. Have you ever lied to your mom growing up and you had an attitude? And you came in and you, should, you know you had a desire to roll your eyes. It was in your mind. 
And that desire was so strong. You didn't realize you actually did it because the desire and your mother said, I know, young lady, you're not rolling your eyes. No, ma'am, I'm not. <laughs> you really didn't want to because of the consequences, but you meditated with the thought so long before you decided you needed to do something about it, your soul had said, girl, go for it. Just roll them. <laughs> it's like there was going to be a relief in you rolling your eyes because the desire started here. <laughs> Have you ever told someone that you didn't mean to do something? that you thought about, but you didn't really know you were going to carry it out. You didn't feel, you knew you shouldn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's imperative. Did I finish reading Romans 12 and 2? I didn't. The renewal of your mind by its ideas, its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So this is another vital point. I'm doing Romans 12, 1 and 2 for me. Yes, everyone around me will benefit from it, but I'm doing it for me. In the body of Christ, sometimes we act like we're doing it for other people. I want to think, I want to talk like I think differently for you. I want to work on my changing my mind for you. How can I love you when you act hateful? How can I embrace you when you are mean? How many of you know meanness is a cover up for insecurity? Oh my God, does anyone know? Meanness is a cover up. It's a cover up for insecurity and rejection. Meanness is a cover up. See, if I know that, if it's in my, I got it. If I got it, it's in my mind. So when someone comes and they're just acting mean, instead of me being offended by their meanness, I feel sorry, have compassion for them because they are utterly insecure, uncomfortable with them. But before I reject them, they decided I'll put out a rejection first. How many times have you snubbed someone because you thought they snubbed you first and you weren't going to let them get by with snubbing you because you got a snub better than they snub? <laughs> I mean, look, we're talking, about, we're talking about in church, right? We're talking about our sisters. You know, I work for our church. I'm on staff at our church, and, you know, statements are being made sometime, and they're so contrary to the word of God, like, oh, she thought she, she, thought she uh, had a comeback. I, you know, I, I really don't know slang good, so I don't know what clout means. I know it means, does it mean like you come back at someone when you, someone make a statement and you say, I clap back? That means you said something that was, Better than they statement, or so you thought it was. And so that you only say clap back when you feel like you, you said something to show them out, show them up, right? <laughs> I, I've just been amazed at how serious it is to want to clap back when someone says something instead of just letting it go. If I let it go, I don't even have to use the energy of clapping back. I just go on. But it's serious. Ah, she clapped back at him. Okay. The way that you and I think, the Apostle Paul, now we do re recall, everyone remember, the Apostle Paul wrote this when he was in prison. Sitting in a prison cell, <laughs> he wrote the revelation of having a transformed mind. 
Now, if anything, anybody ought to pay attention to something somebody said, it should be us when we listened, read uh, Romans. Paul was in prison, sitting, looking at guards every day, clawed in their guard uniform. And God revelated to him, <laughs> Paul, you in prison, but your mind can be renewed to the degree that these cells, these bars, don't feel like bars to you because your mind is so free. You have a hope for your future based on your mind and not your situation. I'm going to repeat it. You have a hope for your future based on your mind and not your situation. Oh, I need to do it again. You have a freedom based on your mind and not your situation. Right now, while you're in the middle of telling your story, what is it going to look like when you begin to walk in the liberty wherein you've been made free? I'm going to walk in the freedom of my mind and not my situations so that situations no longer have a stronghold over me. Situations have no longer have a stronghold over me. This young lady on the movie Imitation of Life, she would get a little bit better because she would, her mother would just be crying and telling her how much she loved her and all, but she hated the fact that she was biracial so much. She hated the stigma of it. She hated it because people would identify her as not being white. Even though she looked white, there was just enough darkness, just enough curl in her hair for people to know Mm, you might not be all the way. Why? Have you ever had anybody look at you and then you realize they're studying you? First they just give you a look. <laughs> then it goes in, into studying you. Mm, is that your real hair? <laughs> Those are real teeth. <laughs> Y'all know I'm, I'm making statements that, of course, this has been asked of me. <laughs> so here she is, and she would cry because she, she loved her mother. She hurt seeing her mother cry like that, but she just could not deal with life based upon hating who she was a part of because that represented a stigma and something negative. That represented never getting to where she could get in life if she was all the way white. So it may not be a racial issue that you have to deal with, but what is it in your story that you may have been dealing with for a majority of your life that you just can't get past that. What is it? I love reading the epistles because I'm reminded every time of Paul and how he overcame in the midst of his turmoil. I just wanted to just stay there. How he learned to overcome in the midst of his turmoil.
Can you do it? No, that's, this is reality right now. It's not the script. Can you do it? Can you, do, can you have a renewed mind to the degree that you can overcome in the midst of what's a turmoil situation in your life? Do you know that on any given Sunday, at any given church, that a church is filled with people with different mindsets? So there are people in the congregation who have a mindset of something they didn't like that the pastor said a year ago that still is strong in their mind. So while he's up preaching or ministering a 2019 message there in 2018 and they are tormented by the statement that was made that they didn't like and they can't get over it so they think so what is the next thing that they're going to do they're going to use what has worked for a portion of their life and that's body language How can I look like I really am really not interested in what you're saying? How skilled am I in doing this? You need to pay attention to the fact that I'm going through something that you caused and you're not saying anything about it. So I'm working on having you go through something every time you look at where I'm seated and see how I'm looking. He said, well, uh, Pastor Nolan, what does this have to do with confidence everything? It's my lack of confidence that makes me act silly. That act, makes me act demeaning toward people. Because you see, if I'm confident, I'm going to value you. Can I say it again? If I'm a confident woman, I'm going to value you. I only devalue when I'm insecure. My confidence makes me want to glean from your confidence. I want you to know I esteem you. I see you. I'm not intimidated by your greatness. You got where you are by an outward manifestation of your ability to be great in this certain area. Why should I be threatened about what you do if I know what I'm to do? No one can do it like me. That's confidence. Ah, so, my thinking affects my life by a framework of patterns. And I want to share this before I close out the message. The framework of patterns, how I think. See, the first person to identify with your lack of confidence and my lack of confidence is me. So why would I spend time trying to find a way to play like I'm confident when I can just be confident? Go back to the director of your story. Look at the script. No one can make you be confident. No one can even lay hands on you and impart confidence. Why? Because confidence is a part of your DNA. From God, the creator's DNA is in us. So it's life that robbed me of confidence. 
not a situation, not people, to say, well, oh, I used to go to another church, but I got robbed of my confidence there. They just stripped me of everything, so I had to leave, and now I don't have any confidence. How many know that's a deception? That's a deception. So we're going to look at these three areas that make up the framework of patterns. Number one, perception. How you and I perceive a thing, a situation. That's part of the framework of establishing a pattern. Number two, it's processing. It's the mental mechanism that takes us where we perceive and translate things into a storyline. An example, after the service, we're having a fellowship, lunch. Not everybody's going to enter the place that we're going to fellowship with the same attitude. Or well, maybe since we've been in service, we will. <laughs> but let's say before we heard the message, some of us will go in, look around, smile, and feel comfortable because we're not insecure or we're not struggling with rejection, so we don't see any reason for people not to want me there too. That's one lady's processing going in. Another one is a lady that's maybe struggled in church and felt unwanted, unreceived, Felt like people are always doing her kind of funny. She hadn't taken into note that she's super shy and doesn't say much, so people may not know how to even approach her. She just knows what she feels when she walks in and she feels so magnified in her presence and that she's on display and people are looking at her and judging her. That's another way to process it. So that's part two of our framework of, framework of patterns. And then there's reactions. That's how we react based up on perceptions and processing. So my reaction depends. If you are a threat to me, I react fighting. I react with hostility. I react with arrogance. I react with, please do not try to come against me because you're going to regret it. This is what in the church we deal with week after week after week after week after week after. And it's all because our confidence has been attacked. Your confidence may have been attacked way before you came here or to any church that you're going to. But you did not produce the story of you according to the director and the script. I feel that God gave me this analogy so that it would have stick to in your thinking. That when you thought about producing a movie, you thought, I'm a story. God is the director with the script and I have not been following it. Listen, ladies, I know it is easy to get saved, feel good about your salvation, but not study your storyline. If I don't study my storyline, 
All I am able to relate to is the reality of the life I live in and have formed for myself. But that's the life that the Apostle Paul said, don't be conformed to that any longer, Alice. But Christians, ladies, we stay conformed to what hurt us, the way we used to think. If I get it in my head, my thinking, no weapon formed against me shall prosper, but that God shall hasten his word to perform it on my behalf. And every tongue that rises up against me, God shall show it to be condemned. This is the heritage of you and I, women of destiny this morning. Someone else wants to hear and see your story so that they can be encouraged to live out their story. Would you stand this morning? What's your story? These patterns. How many things or times do you feel that maybe you perceive something wrong. Therefore, you processed it, processed it wrong, and your actions then became wrong. A cry for confidence. A cry to feel confident. You all, do you know why we cry for confidence? Because God put that in us. He put that your desire to be confident is the will of God concerning you. These other things that make up a personality that some of us may have is not a part of the script that God gave you for your life. I already didn't feel good about myself. And I didn't have confidence as a teenager. And when I met the young man that I married, at first I thought this is going to be so good for me. He said he loves me. And I'm thinking he's going to always be there validating me and encouraging me but the voice someone needs to hear it come on the voice that made me feel confident became the same voice to strip me of everything that I had in my heart that said, you're not less than Alice. You're just as good as. And so living in a life, a marriage filled with affairs after affairs after affairs, in my mind, every other woman became a witness to me of you're not good enough and you're not good as. So it came to a place that I felt utterly defeated. I had too many contending for the prize and I knew that I did not have winning credentials. Oh, somebody here. But see, I blamed it on so many things, but through my story, a long life, I found some of the most gorgeous women, beautiful women, that I would go up to compliment them, and I would think, oh my God, you're just stunning. And then when they began to tell their story, uh, so I found out their story was so much like my story. 
And in my head, I'm thinking, how can your story be like my story and you look like this? Why? Because, see, I painted my picture and it was nothing like her picture. And you mean she has the same story. Anyone getting this this morning? It's... How you perceive yourself as a woman today. You process your life according to your perception of you. And your actions are based on those factors now. You're living life and your framework of patterns is self-defeating. And no matter how much someone says you're beautiful, you don't believe it. You doesn't matter how much someone says you're awesome, you don't believe it. This morning, God established an assignment of purpose for you to find yourself saying, my life is the story I'm telling. I know in imitation of life, it was such a sad ending, but it's not our ending. It's not our ending. I wanted you to see that hope deferred makes the heart sick. God wants you to wake up to your true identity. And <laughs> see, it's important. Come on, ladies. It's important for you and I to understand. You've got to believe that you're awesome before you see your awesomeness. Somebody can come on. You've got to believe sick because it starts where? So you got to believe it. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. God, I don't see it, but I believe it. I don't feel it, but I believe it, God. So I'm going to start right here with my belief system. Because my belief system is going to continue until the transformation starts affecting my soul. My soul's in pain, God. I'm tired of praying and I don't even believe what I pray. Oh. The Bible says hope is the anchor of our soul in there. There's so many of you that you've resorted to surviving and not thriving survival is a man made emotion to keep on going when you really want to quit and that's not God's will for you and I to just struggle to survive Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I, you are right today. Oh, he got this week. I just wanted, I said, God, I want it to be a room full of ladies who establish a truth about themselves that take on identity according to your purpose for them in who they are and God that they recognize that on this day the 27th of April 2019 that you gave them beauty for ashes God I want it you know have you ever just wanted something those of you with children those of you how you can want for your children to the degree that you began to have an aching inside for it to manifest. So I want to say, is it okay to pray for? 
If you feel like you came this morning, but you were drained, you were just mentally drained in regard to what's next for my life. Where am I going from here? You were calling it your story. We made that. I shared and made that become a part of you relating to your life. What's your story? God gave me my story. I was living a story, but I realized it wasn't my story. I have a story. You have a story. A God-given story, ladies. You do. You have a story. And God did not favor anyone else's story over yours. And we so much of the time feel like that. Oh, my story's okay, but it's not really good. But it is. This morning for every lady that's willing to say, I'm going to read and rehearse my true script from God. Because my story changes today as a result of First Ladies of Van Buren, Arkansas versus Civil God Church. I recognize the truth. My identity has been hiding from me. If that's you this morning, I would like for you to come. I want to touch and agree with you that you won't give up. You're making the choice. I'm just coming in agreement with you. There's power in numbers. If one puts a thousand to fly to a bit ten thousand, I just want you to know. Your story is awesome. God wants you to see your story. Please don't be embarrassed about your age. I made a decision, God. At my age, I am unwilling to give up because my story has not been told. How many of you know God can take the ladder and give you so much fulfillment and victory in your story that you'll find yourself forgetting your form? <laughs> That's the will of God concerning us. Uh, I want to decree over you, you shall live. <laughs> Women of God, you shall live. When I say live, I'm talking about the abundant life. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Angelo, could you come up front, please? Thank you, sweetheart. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. You have fought the good fight of faith. And it has not been without much pain much grieving and much lack of understanding first of all 